Welcome to our Charmers, to the Community Habit of Action Research on Mondays. This is already our nth lecture of uh, the term, and this is in preparation for our Action Research, Action Learning Congress happening in 2021. We have not formally announced that one, but all of this one will be in preparation for our International Congress. Okay, without much ado, I now call on Dr. Maricar Prodente, the Chair of ARAL, to introduce today's featured speaker. Dr. Bing? Yes, uh, can I be heard? Can Loud you hear me? Okay, yep. so good morning, Charmers. It's been uh, over a week since we last saw each other. I hope our Charmers from the Bicol region and other affected provinces are able to join us today. I got some messages from them, hoping that the internet connection will not fail them today. Anyway, this morning we are very lucky again to have with us a budding uh, action researcher in the person of Miss Jessica Obrial. She is a graduate uh, of uh, Philippine Normal University, BSE in mathematics, and also completed her master's in uh, education major in mathematics with the science education department of De La Salle University. Right now, uh, she used to uh, be a faculty of Coleo San Agustin until she recently went to the U.S. and she's now a mathematics teacher at the middle school at North Carolina. So without further ado, I'd like to give the meeting room to uh, Miss Jessica Obrial, who is going to share with us her experiences in conducting action research in improving the teaching of mathematics, particularly statistics. So, Jessica? Yes, Jessica, you can take the floor or the meeting room. Yes, um, good, uh, good evening, everyone, because right now there's an 11 hour difference. So, right now it's 9 p.m. here, but I know there it's already 10 o'clock in the morning, in Monday. Um, again, before I start my talk, can you please access the link I've given in the chat? Uh, so far. So if there are questions that I'll ask you, you can interact with the slide. So far, okay. So first I'm going to start my talk regarding why action research. Uh, action research in education can be defined as the process of studying a school situation to understand and improve the quality of the educative process. Uh, it provides practitioners with new knowledge and understanding about how to improve educational practices or resolve significant problems in classrooms and schools. And yes, I know we have been encountering this definition most of the time. We have seen this, but then to feel it and to experience it firsthand is quite different from what we are just seeing. And I'm just going to give you a short story on why did I choose action research as my course of study as well. Uh, during my master's degree program in La Salle, I've been exposed to different action research forums. And we had chances to present our papers and for me to learn new, new things about teaching and reflecting upon my actions. And then, of course, these forums made me realize and at least understand on how to properly conduct action researches. Now, why did I choose action research? Now, being an educator, it's a lifelong process of learning and growing. And in some way or another, we have already been doing action research. The fact that every time we check our test papers and then we notice that there is a student or there's a lot of our students having top, having difficulty in accessing or having difficulty in understanding that certain concept, we are already starting to reflect. And then what doesn't or what doesn't connect is that no matter how much we reflect, 
if we're not going to put that into action, if we are not going to document it, we, our reflection process is incomplete. So in that regard, I chose to do action research so that I would understand and I can reflect and I can improve my teaching. So how did action research help me grow as a teacher? Now it helped me grow by making me realize the importance of looking at the processes my students make while learning. Uh, there's one thing I've learned out of all the years I've been teaching, although it's not that long compared to some of the us, um, I have been noticing that before, I only look at my students as what their output shows me. So for example, this student just shows me a score of three over 20, and then I had this tendency to label that student with that score. So my problem now is that when I partake in action research, now I realize that my students are, not, are more than their scores. So it made me realize that there might be something in my teaching or there might be some ways for me to improve what they are learning and how they are learning. So in this way, I am checking the processes on how they understand the certain concepts. And while checking that, and while checking that processes, I am also understanding at the same time the way I will be better and the way my students will be better. Um, and because of that, I will be presenting to you one of the action researches I've performed and, and helped me become a better teacher under the leadership of my mentor, Dr. Lapinid. Uh, the use of statistical investigation in assessing students' understanding and performance in statistics. So there are four agendas I'm going to present to you today. First, of course, would be the introduction. Later on, I'm going to present the methodology. And then the results analysis and my reflection as an action researcher. So first, for the introduction, so for the introduction, uh, teaching statistics in the Philippines, you know, the reason, the main reason why, although mathematics have a lot of strands, we know that math in K to 12, the K to 12 curriculum has the numbers in algebra, we had geometry, but why did I choose statistics? It's because I remembered when I was in, um, when I was a student in high school, or even in elementary, I never really learned statistics. The only time I encountered statistics was when I was in fourth year high school, and it was the last quarter of that year. And then, of course, understanding time, and my teachers are my teacher is making sure that she finishes everything. Um, she just thought that in a hurry, and then she skipped most of the part. She gave us the formula, and then that's it. So, of course, and then I encountered statistics again when I was in college because it was part of a major subject. And then I realized, why did I never really learn this when I was in high school? So now, we are implementing statistics in K-12. to It's since it has been new to me and I've never really experienced it as, an, as a student. So of course, being a teacher and trying to teach something I never encountered, I never really encountered before, encountered before um, gave me a chance to think, how could I improve my teaching, some, my teaching in something this new to me? So on your pair grid, I want you to type in, oh sorry, uh, what problems have you encountered in teaching statistics under the K-12 curriculum? So I'll give you uh, three minutes again. Please uh, type in your response in your pair deck slide. What problems have you encountered in teaching statistics under the K-12 curriculum? Uh, again, if you need the link, here's the link. So, so far, I have one response. So, I'll give you three minutes. You have until uh, 9.17 to type your answers in the chat. And, you know, in this way, the reason why I'm asking you this is maybe we can find a common ground or there are some unique problems we haven't encountered. And maybe 
as a group, we can try to resolve and give each, uh, each other suggestions on how to improve our craft. Let's check. Okay, there are five responses so far. Uh, uh, don't worry if you type your responses in here, your names won't be shown. So of course you will be anonymous. So just type in here what the problems you encountered are. So I have a... Uh... So you have two minutes left. Okay, so here are the responses I received so far. Someone here said more of plug and chug than deeply understanding what each statistical measure is for. That's true. I felt that way as well when I was teaching statistics. Uh, time is not enough to deliver the competencies. Uh, okay. We have, uh, we have someone who haven't taught statistics in the K-12 curriculum, but I'm attending this webinar to gain new insights and teaching. I'm a college instructor, but I really found it. Oh, you're still typing. Okay. Uh, not a statistics teacher. I understand. More content, no mastery. Students are initially scared. No stat software. Lots of paperwork. Too broad. Not enough time to plan. That's true. That's true. So we have a minute left. We have one minute left, please. Um, your insights are very much welcome. Mm, okay. Okay, so time's up. I'm just going to give an overview of the responses I received so far. So, of course, the most common one is time is not enough to deliver the competencies. And I have experienced this firsthand as well. We had too many competencies to address. And we had a college instructor, but it's really interesting to know how far the senior high school teacher teaches statistics and want to consider teaching inferential statistics in junior year. Oh, so you need a reference where you can start your module for this subject. Uh, not a statistics teacher. Oh, you're a college instructor. That's right. We also have more content, no mastery. There's a lot of paperwork. Sometimes the topics get too broad. There's not enough time to plan. Yes, poor mathematical skills of the learners. It's also a problem because when we've noticed that um, mathematics sometimes are, in, no, it's interconnected discipline. So if a gap is found, then we will have difficulties in accessing the next level. Oh, there are Filipino author books with errors. Okay. Students aren't familiar with the use of Excel. Yes, that's right. It, it can be boring to teach. It's more on formulas. Uh, been teaching statistics and research. So, so again, thank you so much for your responses. Wait, I will let this uh, finish. I will let you finish your response. So yes, it seems that we have been feeling the same way. There are more content we need to finish even though we don't have a lot of time, provided also that there's a lot of suspensions and less contact time with students. There is the concept of students learning the formula. That's why the students get stuck there. So if they don't know the formula, they don't know how to use it. Oh, okay. So that deleted it. Okay. So again, thank you so much for your responses. I really appreciate it. Now this, your answers are telling me that we have the same problems. 
and we will try to i can't really address it with you but maybe we can find tips or suggestions on how we can tackle this problem so what are the things that i noticed that needs to be addressed first the role of statistics in the k-12 curriculum I'm go we are going to identify the factors that are deterrent and contributory to students' statistical investigation, which will, which will be seen, uh, seen later in the results. The use of statistical investigation as a promising approach in making statistics an application to real-life situations and to make a contribution to the growing body of statistics education in the Philippines by conducting a statistical investigation. So first, the role of, this, of statistics in the K-12 curriculum. Now, statistics, often called data analysis and probability, is now considered an important component of the K-12 curriculum. Now, why did I mention that I find it important? It's because it's now part of the strands, and this is the topic that we have to keep on repeating. And remember that the main tenet of K-12 curriculum is the spiraling, and so if we or if a teacher in the previous level fails to teach one portion of statistics, our students will have that gap and they will not know what to do in the next level. And then standards in the curriculum now require statistics to be applied in critical thinking, problem solving, reasoning, communicating, and decision making in real life. Now, the statistics studies in the Philippines uh, Yes, that's right. Expensive stat software. Um, a study conducted by Reston Krishnan and Idris 2014 compared the statistics education research in Malaysia and the Philippines. And unfortunately, during this time that my study was uh, performed, an electronic search was conducted for published research papers on statistics education in 2000 to 2012, and only 19 studies have been published in the Philippines. And what's so sad is that out of 19 of those studies that have been published during that time, 18 are focused on university level pedagogy. And only one is referred, only one focuses on basic level statistics education. And what made this a bit difficult is that since we don't have a lot of studies to back up, we are looking for other studies in another country. But then if we always look at other country studies, we might not, it might not apply to us. So we might have problems in implementing that. And then this research papers, uh, moreover, this research papers published use multiple methodological approaches that focus solely on quantitative research. And if we check the K to 12 curriculum, it is required now that statistics be applied as a qualitative means or quantitative and qualitative means on making the students understand statistics. So it's not only about them learning the formulas, it's about them hopefully applying those formulas. Now, statistical, so the use of statistical investigation as an approach in making statistics an application to real life situations is that statistical investigation now has become the response of statisticians in the teaching and learning of statistics. It is anchored on real world situations and is undertaken to seek meaning about observed phenomena. Now statistics offers other fields of study, a set of ideas and tools for dealing with that. Now, according to Cobb and Moore, statistics requires a different kind of thinking because data are not just numbers, but with a context. Now, what's the problem with statistics? If we compare it to our normal mathematics, there is a study that says mathematics and statistics are different. Why? Because, for example, in mathematics, when we say number three is equal two plus one, number three, that's it. Of course, unless it's in number theory or another area of math. But then in statistics, the number three is different depending on the context. Statistics are not just numbers. In statistics, numbers are not just numbers, but it, it, it has a context. So for example, when you say uh, three people eat burgers daily, it's different from saying three out of 100 people do not wear masks. So that is also one big difference with statistics is that we look at data, not only as data, but we check the context of data as well. 
Now, now this led to the re the researchers me to reintroduce statistics as a subject anchored on real world problems. And in this regard, a statistical investigation was used as the link to real life situations. And this study explored the processes students went through as they completed the statistical investigation, which will be shown in our methodology. So what are the research questions that were posed during my action research is that first, how do students conduct? So I'm after how they do things um, in terms of its four processes, formulating a question, collect data, analyze data, interpret results, and what are the students' levels of statistical understanding during the investigation? And what are the merits and challenges encountered by the students during the statistical investigation? So it's my research design. The research design is about this study is an action research that is classroom-based and teacher-driven to show authentic practices using the initial cycle of innovation, research, reflection, and recommends further improvement of the approach for the next cycle of practice. So these are the participants that I chose during that time. So this study was conducted in an intact intact class of 44 grade 10 heterogeneous students from a private school in a highly urbanized area in the Philippines with the lead researcher as the teacher implementer. And then what made, why did I choose grade 10, of course, aside from I'm teaching grade 10 during that time? Um, it's what made them so special is that they are one of the first set of students who are under the K-12 curriculum. So it is a chance for me to understand and check if the K-12 curriculum is really aligned and if the statistical processes are already present when they reach the certain year level. And also, um, we had, so those 44 students, I've asked them through, I've asked permission from their parents and since most of them were 15 to 17. And then they voluntarily agreed to be part of my investigation. And also what made them very special is that if we check the K-12 curriculum on the grade 10 area, it is required that students know how to produce a statistical mini research. And that made me think, since these students are already in grade 10, and they should have learned the standards that they should have learned in the previous year levels, have they already, will, can they apply it in that statistical mini research we are going to do in a class? So for the instruments, I had a worksheet, we had field notes, observations, we had student reflections. During that time, they, they are asked to have student reflections and then our focus group discussions. So the implementation theory is the GAIS model framework. We had formulating a question, they're collecting data, and then each process component has certain levels as well. So I'm going to check during each phase if they've reached level A, level B, or level C. We had collect data, we had analyze data, and then we interpret the results. So the whole process is that the meetings were divided according to the GAIS framework. First, they are tasked to formulate questions. And I let them, uh, the researcher let the students pose questions they plan to answer using statistical measures and achieving the, the objectives. In achieving the objective or purpose of their mini research. And since authentic data, make statistical investigation relevant and possibly, hopefully, more em enjoyable, the researcher gave students the freedom to choose their own topic. So during the formulating questions, I let them choose their topics. Of course, while doing that, I'm also checking and assessing if their questions are appropriate, which we will find out later. And then before they were given approval to proceed to the next step, which is data collection. And then in the third phase, does that data they collected, they will analyze it and they will also determine which 
um, which measure they should use, and they're going to interpret the results they found. Now, during the, and then afterwards, each group presented their study in the class. Now, during that entire statistical investigation, the researcher assisted the students who had inquiries. So, of course, a scaffolding is necessary since, of course, they're still grade 10, 10 grade students. And then they wrote their reports. They need to write their reports first before they, they presented their study in the class. So, for data analysis, the student's level of statistical understanding in this investigation process, so for every level that they are in, for every phase they are in, they were determined through the indicators of the GAIS framework and to ensure the reliability of the levels of statistical understanding, uh, two senior teachers aside from the researcher assess the levels of the student's output. So the raters first evaluated students' outputs individually per indicator in each process component. And then, of course, during that time, there is a thematic analysis of the qualitative data. And since I am after the process of the students, I have checked them, uh, you, their interviews, observation field notes, and individual student reflections were analyzed using thematic analysis of the six-phase framework. And then the researchers followed the six phases, not necessarily in linear order, to become familiar with the data. They generate initial codes, search for themes that's common, review the themes, and then define themes and write up regarding their themes. So now here are the results. So what emerged during and after the course of study? So for studying the results, first one, when they were formulating questions, here are some sample student questions. So based on the questions that they think are interesting for them, they're formulated by the students. 26 out of 61 were focused on academic subjects they were taking during that time. 13 questions were about the improvement of the class general average. And then they discussed the special subjects such as Filipino language for foreigner students and special physical education. Now, these are some, uh, during the formulating questions process, the students are required to check in with me and check if their questions are appropriate for the statistical mini research and if they're already, if they're really performing the standard. So these are some of the questions that they formulated at the start. First, how does being an athlete affect grade? Second, do extracurricular activities affect student performance? And does the teacher's performance affect the student's performance in class? Now, this questions, if you've noticed, are a bit qualitative in nature because they are after what, what are the effects or, and they're not really, they're not really after performing the standard. This is what I've noticed. They're not really after performing the standard. They're just doing things literally that is what are their interests. And out of these questions, one of the questions struck me most is that does the teacher's performance affect the student's performance in class? So I tried asking the group who created that question. And then I told them, okay, so you had this question. How do you plan to address this question? Oh, miss, that's easy. So that's what they've been telling me. Miss, that's easy. All we're going to do is create a survey questionnaire. Of course, the name and the specific data. And then ask the question, does the teacher's performance affect the student's performance in class? Yes or no. So that is the extent of what they've been thinking. So they thought that all kinds of questions are fine and they're not really creating, they're just after creating questions that they think fit on what they like. So based on the GAIS framework, the questions that they form, these are the markers or the indicators. So first, most of them are level A's. They have questions of interest. They had le uh, level B because uh, it became level B because the students are really interested. This is based on what they feel and not by what the teacher dictated to them. We had also the question restriction and then the overall performance was most of an A. 
And then these are merits and challenges of the statistical investigation during the formulating questions. And again, uh, during the formulating questions phase, so every in every phase that they have, the students are checking, the students are required to give a personal reflection, a personal reflection within their own feelings and with the group. So these are the merits and challenges that most of the students have found in, or most of the students stated in general. So the merits is because I kept on rejecting their questions. They now learn the difference between quantitative and qualitative research. Because those students, most of them are only familiar with the definition, which is of course very typical of students. And then since they lack their, their best or their greatest challenge is that they lack experience in constructing quantitative questions. But then of course, that has been addressed because of the scaffolding by the researcher. And then a group merit is that there was during this time, and since this is just the first phase of the study, there was collaboration and patience with group members. And then the challenges they had as a group is that there are passive group members, there are uncooperative group members, and there's distracted group members, and one member affects the rest of the members. And you know, you know that during group work is that one of, if, and since they only have four students for every group, they are having difficulty if one of those starts to act up, the rest would spend their time telling that other person to go straight, but then of course, they, it will be a waste of time. Now for collecting data, um, for collecting data we had, so these are some, these are the ways the students, my students collected data during that time where they did personal interviews, five of them used, five groups used this technique. We had the survey questionnaire, four of them used this technique and they use social media to, during this technique. Now, unfortunately, most of them got a level A according to the GAYS framework. Why is it that way? It's because most of them just interviewed. They didn't really try to design for differences. They didn't think of accommodations and the type of experiment they had is just a simple one simple experiment, they didn't think of doing sampling. Um, they didn't do random samples. All they did was, okay, you're my classmates, so I'm going to experiment. I'm, I'm going to ask you as my sample, answer my question. And then of course, so everyone got a level A. So for collecting data, these are the merits and the challenges most of them realized for personal gains they learned about the ethical treatment of samples. And then of course, their challenge is that there is refusal of some samples to disclose information necessary to the statistical investigation process. And for the group in gathering data, utmost supervision of the samples are needed and dividing tasks is easier in data collection, especially if the sample size is large. And for challenges, there are uncooperative samples and lack of cooperation from, of course, their group members. And then what struck them the most is that they realized that not everyone can be interviewed. There are some of my groups of students who are asking about the performance of the class in terms of grades. And they tried asking, or what subject are they having difficulty in and what is their grade? So there, I have some students who tried asking uh, one of their group members, or no, one of their samples, one of their classmates, so what subject are you having a hard time in? And then of course that sample answered. And then when they had their follow-up question that, that what subject or what grade did you got, did you get there? The student did not reply. So of course, even if they tried forcing them, they can't really, they can't really get the answer from their classmate. So they learned it, yes, they learned it the hard way. They learned about the ethical treatment of samples. So for analyzing data uh, during this phase of the investigation, um, if you look over the 
analyzing data. These are the methods they presented their data. We had, of course, they presented the table, a pie chart, a frequency distribution table. They used paragraphs to describe their data. We had bar charts, we have line graphs, we have histograms. So these are all the ways they presented, it, they presented their data. So basically during their 10th grade, this is what they know to use. Now the problem here is this. Even though if we compare the methods in presenting data, there are a lot, but then only a few of them are appropriate. Some of them are unlabeled because we don't really know, yes, they had this, because they see it in Excel, they see a pie chart there, they copy it, they put the data, they don't label it because they don't know how to. Some of them mislabel the data, some of them present incomplete data, and then there is a group that showed me unnecessary, uh, unnecessary visual displays. And this, you, you see the one in group one is what shocked me. It's because when I asked them to give me an update of what they've worked so far, this group has showed me a very thick output. It's like the other groups are only three pages, four pages. And then this group gave me 10 to 20 pages during that time. Of course, I was shocked, only to find out when I flipped every page, I saw that they put one pie chart, one line graph, different types of graphs in every page. So yes, it is, it is unnecessary, but then they had this thinking, the students had this thinking, when I asked them, why did you do it? Why did you spend a lot of paper just to, to print one page for a pie chart? And then they told me, they think that in a research, more pages means more grades, which is, of course, not true. And here's a sample of what the students did. Um, they presented this two at the same time, but they are showing the same type of data. And when they were analyzing it, they were telling me the frequency, cumulative frequency, at least they know how to compute for it. And they also showed me this uh, pie chart. When I tried asking them, why did you show me frequency and cumulative frequency? You didn't even compute for the mean, median, and so on. Oh, it's because that's what we've learned in class. So we just tried incorporating these things in class, uh, uh, in our research. Uh, and then I said, of course, uh, oh, okay. And then I asked them, since you already presented your data this way, why bother putting a pie chart? Oh, it's because they were, they were this is what they've been telling me, that the pie chart is one of the most common ways to present data. But then of course, this way, I've realized that even though they've reached this year level, there are still some things they have misconceptions on that I need to work on. And then if we check uh, under the GAIS perform, uh, under the GAIS framework, there are based on the indicators when they analyze their data, they are on level A for properties of distribution. Only a few of them use variability as a level A. Comparison of groups, level A. They are in level A, it's because either they used it or they really not used it because they didn't know how to use it. Sampling, association, and overall performance. So here are the merits and challenges of analyzing data. So for, personally, this is what they felt. Now during analyzing data, the students learned how to apply statistical measures and specific statistical problems. Uh, this is what I realized when I was giving them this portion. Analyzing data is very crucial. We all know as researchers, analyzing data is very crucial because no matter how pointless our data is if it, or how big or how small our data is, if we don't know how to analyze it properly, our data, no matter how powerful, is useless. And then my students learned how to apply statistical measures and specific statistical problems, which they are thankful for because they're telling me they're going to use it in their um, in senior high school. And then their challenge is, of course, lack of knowledge in applying state statistics in data gathered. And then for the group, 
the group merit is that they learned how to they learned accuracy and thoroughness during the course of the study and then cooperation and mentoring members of the group now their challenge during this time during analyzing data is that there's inconsistent data provided by the sample how did they realize this it's just it is because when some of the other groups tried checking their research questions with another group and then they realized that their research question is almost the same except that they are looking at something in general and they, the other group is looking for a specific subject and then they realized that this student they had a sample who said that who gave who gave the correct answer or who gave the proper data to the other group and they gave uh, fraudulent data to the other group so that's what that's what they realized that's when they realized it there are inconsistent data provided by the sample and then of course and since analyzing data is one of the hardest portions of research students are starting to lack enthusiasm and then since they know that analyzing data is pure math, some of the group members started to lose interest and they just let the, the smart ones do the work for this portion of the data. Most of them were active during data collection and formulating questions, but then when analyzing data came, they started losing interest. And then there's also, which, it, which I've stated, dependency of some group members to knowledgeable members of the group. And then for interpreting data, now this is the part where after computing, after checking out how to compute, analyze the data, now they're going to make sense of it. So first, this is what showed up. Most of them summarize, uh, summarize the results. They have showed variability of the results and their certainty about the conclusions. Again, this one is part of the GAZE framework. So of course, at least most of them summarize the results they found out, but they don't know how to vary it. And then for student interpretation, so based on the, oh wait, which portion? So there. So for interpreting data, this is part of the GAZE framework. Uh, looking beyond the data, most of them got level B. Because when you say looking beyond the data, it's not about just this is the number, that's it. They at least tried to make sense of what the number found or what they found out about that certain number. They also generalized. They noted a few of them noted differences. Some of them tried only a few of them, only two of them got a level B in association cause and effect and the overall performance of the class. And then again, for interpreting data, making sense of the data, these are the personal and the group merits and challenges. For merits, at least now they learned how to interpret and express the data the students have gathered. And again, their practice for subjects taken in senior high school. Their challenge here as well is making meaning of data because of course, they're making meaning. These things happened at first if there is no scaffolding, but when the researcher gave scaffolding, the students had this aha moment. Ah, so that's how you, so that's how you understand what the data is about. And then of course, lack of knowledge and using proper statistical terminology. So they don't really know how to, uh, so for example, they got the mean of the value. All they say is, oh, so the mean is five point something. That's it. They don't, Related to the original problem they formed, all they did was, this is the number, this is the mean, that's it. And then we also had for the group merits and challenges, we have cooperation and active participation from the group members. And then the dissemination of information in the processes of statistical investigation to all members of the group. Okay, so now we have our reflection, my personal reflection, how did the study impact my teaching methods? So first, the very important role of the teacher. Now this study has shown the importance of guidance, monitoring and feedback in each phase of the statistical investigation process. And of course, aside from diligently providing specific feedback, 
the teacher also learned to pay close attention and supervision over students because some groups have a tendency to lose focus in the middle of the task. I remember that this uh, action, uh, this statistical investigation for the students took 14 meetings. During that time, there were 11 groups. If there is a group, I tried my best to look at the outputs of each group. And then, of course, I've noticed that there are some groups that when you are not close to them, they start slacking off. And then, of course, aside from the students started to slacking, to, the students started to slack off, they also have a problem wherein if there is a certain concept they want to work on, and if they're having difficulty, there are either two responses. One of them goes to you and asks. The other one waits for you to ask. So, of course, I tried, uh, the teacher tried the, her best to go to each student to address their specific needs. Next, for formulating questions, the lack of input during the investigation in this cycle hindered the development of the statistical understanding of the student. Now, at times, the teacher was tempted to phrase the question for the students since this is easier than asking students to the right guiding or probing question that can lead them to formulate the right research question. Now, this could have been avoided if enough examples of questions were given so students could be wary if their formulated question elicits quantitative or qualitative data for statistical treatment. And for formulating questions during this time, since, of course, it is expected by DepEd that students can create a statistical mini research at 10th grade. The teacher has this expectation as well that if I give them this certain task, they can work on. Now, the problem is when I see them doing the research, now I've realized the problems had started to, to show up. And number one, they don't know the difference between qualitative and quantitative data. Number two, they need examples on how to create questions. Number three, their interests are more of hobby-based than actual sol solving for qualitative data, uh, quantitative data for them to create a statistical mini research. Now for collecting data, this is my reflection. Now collecting data as an activity also develops students' skills in interacting with other people. Now, in this study, the turnout of data were not as expected. Students needed to follow up their respondents because they, the students during that time had the thinking wherein if they go to that certain, if they, uh, they had this thinking wherein all of their classmates are aware that they need to have data, they are just waiting for their samples to give their data to them and they're not even following it up. And then also, they learned to respect their respondents' privacy if they chose not to divulge some information such as their grade. And the, the students during this time had that thinking wherein they think if they ask some people questions that is related to the subject, their classmates would answer, which is, of course, false. And they learned that the hard way during this um, statistical investigation. Now for analyzing and interpreting data, in this study, the students analyzed and interpreted the data collected on their own. However, the students' naive treatment to data resulted in a shallow interpretation and analysis of the study. Now, the, sco the scaffolding of the teacher was not enough in addressing the needs of the students during the data analysis. Now, this one was very, during that time, this is a bit sad for me because of course, again, expectations. When they were in grade 10, they're expected to create a statistical mini research. And then during that time, they have learned how to create, they have learned how to use the measures of central tendency in seventh grade. They have learned how to use probability on eighth grade. Ninth grade in the K-12 curriculum has nothing, has no, it doesn't have the statistics strand. And then on 10th grade, they, are learned, they need to learn about the measures of position. So of course, as a teacher, since they already learned about this topic, you were expecting that they should up, at least know how to apply that to data. But then it's not enough and it's not showing up. Even if the, the 
teacher gave a scaffolding during that time to address how to answer the question. It's not enough because there are certain gaps that have to be filled. And there. And then uh, this is one more. This is now my personal point of view. This one isn't part of my paper. My my paper is done. My study was done. And these are the some of the few things I've realized in here when I was and when I'm teaching in the US. It's the same thing. We are also implementing the K-12 curriculum. And I'm sharing this. Because I know you have realized that our course of study, our K-12 curriculum is based on the K-12 curriculum here, which I've noticed is the same, a bit the same. And then the difference here is that the sequencing of the strands here and trying to emphasize the connection between the standards. Now in here, in the US, even though it's still the K-12 curriculum, they tried as much as possible to connect the strand. So for example, statistics. Statistics is not thought sing, uh, single-handedly. So for example, during the time I was teaching in seventh grade middle school, um, the students are learning about integers. And then part of the requirement well, from the standards is that the mean is included in the discussion of the positive of, of integers. So in that way, I think um, the connection between the standards have been a bit established. And even though the statistics strand is at the last part of the curriculum, since we keep on going back to that, the students won't have a hard time understanding that standard. And, and so far, when I ask my other, the other Filipino teachers here who have taught math as well, they are telling me the same thing about their reflection that yes, they have taught K-12 curriculum, but then right now it's a bit of the sequencing here that is different and the emphasis between the connection of the standards. And then, oh wait, thank you so much for letting me talk for an hour. I really appreciate it. If you have questions, you can start typing it in here. Okay. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was very insightful for the statistics enthusiasts out there. That was really very helpful. Okay. Um, I encourage everyone to type in their questions in the chat box if you have any questions. And since, oh, it's only 10.57, we have enough time to call on uh, uh, whoever if they want to raise their questions um, uh, using the microphones. Okay, I'm looking at the chat box right now. I don't see any questions. Okay, uh, would anyone like to ask any question? Okay. Looks like our attendees, I, I'm not so sure if our attendees have already taught stats in their schools, okay, or just general math. Okay. So I'll start the, the, the question, okay. While others are still probably putting together their thoughts. Okay, um, uh, Jessica. Yes. Okay. Uh, probably what our participants need at the moment would be, you know, a topic on AR if they are handling math subjects. Okay. But it's it's a general question, you know. I mean, it may not be really on the stats. Okay. But I'm what I'm hoping is that you can uh, probably share with our participants any thoughts on what topic they can work on for their small scale action research project if they are teaching math or if they are handling math related subjects, stat, math, geometry, any of those math subjects. Uh, you have any like thoughts on that? You can probably oh, share with participants. Um, regarding that, I would like to suggest that you do the same thing as me so that of course we would grow our knowledge on statistics. And at the same time, since uh, you're saying small scale, 
I would suggest that instead of now, if you've noticed my topic, my topic that is about um, statistical investigation, technically we are already doing it. This is the research subject, but this research subject is usually given to English teachers. So I suggest that you try to work with your English teacher and you go to the you work with them during the data analysis phase or the, the data analysis phase and then you try to create an action research on how they handle the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good suggestion. Uh -huh. Can I ask can I ask a question? Yes, uh please Paul. Okay, go ahead. I'm I'm using my phone. So uh okay. Since, Go ahead. since since it's been a time uh, since it's been a while now that you are teaching in the US do you did you notice any uh, similarity in terms of mathematical misconceptions among the students there in the US and uh, also from your experience here in the Philippines yes <laughs> yes i think that um, mathematical misconceptions are universal in that aspect and uh, for example, I've taught a uh, seventh grade last year. The students in the Philippines are having a hard time uh, grasping the concept of positive and negative integers. And also, we all know that the foundation of that is, of course, the times tables, the, the simple arithmetic processes, and they're also having that problem here in the U.S. And aside from that, it's a bit, some of my students are having a hard time answering word problems as well. It's because the way they word it is a bit, uh, the students are not used to solving word problems, which is, I think, the same in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested to know, Jessica, are the mathematics teachers in middle school also doing action research? Oh, um, in, yes, we are also doing action research. We are also checking how the students perform. We have this thing called a PLC where in uh, the professional learning community, where in for every lunch time or their specific meeting times with the teachers, it's usually one to two times a week. We present uh, on the first week, uh, sorry, on the first, because in the setting in my school right now is we have two PLC meetings. The first PLC meetings is only about the presentation of the lesson, how will we teach the lesson. Um, it's like, for example, I'm assigned to teach uh, lesson 10 in open up, like how do I teach the slope to the students? I would teach that to my co-teachers, to my colleagues. And then the next PLC session will be the, the data that we gathered when we taught the lesson, we are checking on how to improve that data. And then of course we are doing documentation as well, but of course not as formal as this one. But we try to do action research in our school as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jessica, we have requests from our participants. Uh, if they can uh, get a copy of your slides, would you be willing to share with our participants a copy of your slides? Uh, yes, of course. Any other questions from our participants? Uh, this is more of a curious curiosity, <laughs> Jessica. Right now, I uh, is in. I mean, in your area, are you still in quarantine or some kind, or are you <laughs> now on face to face? Ah, um, in terms of teaching, there are some counties because we have different counties here in North Carolina. There are some counties that have started uh, teaching face to face in. Um, the, since the start of the school year. But then in the county I am in, we are going to start the last week of November. But then the system is that not all of the students will come back. It's more of uh, group A, group B. So basically okay. the, yeah, the students only go to school two times a week and then they are required to wear masks inside the, the classroom. And only 10 students are allowed, 10 to 15 students are allowed inside the classroom. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. I think in so Japan. Are you are you using also online learning modules? Ah, uh, we have this uh, in because we I'm teaching in Charlotte, North, North Carolina. We have our district has paid for an online learning module. It's called Open Up Resources. 
So we get all of our data, all of all of our um what do you call that? All of our modules from there, uh, which is already linked in our Canvas pages. So we don't really, so here in the US, we don't really create our, our learning modules. It's already provided for us. All we do is just implement it. Okay, so there's a question coming from Wenz uh, Alvin Gabay. Okay, uh, is this, uh, Wenz, would you like to read or I can read it for you? Okay, statistical investigation is usually done in the senior high school. In your study, your participants were grade 10 students. How did you bridge the competency gaps for them to follow through the course? Interesting. Oh, uh, during that time, that's the problem. It is an expectation that the students create a statistical mini research during their grade 10 in the K-12 curriculum based on the pacing guide provided by DepEd. And then in regards to learning gaps, that's a problem. I did not, the, the learning gaps did not show up before the, so it is a suggestion that you check the learning gaps if there are uh, before you start the research. Because when I was doing, when the class was doing the research, it is when it showed up. It is when it showed up that, uh, it is the time that it showed up where there are gaps that need to be addressed. So that's what I've mentioned in the analyzing and interpreting data. Um, wait, where's that? Uh, I've mentioned in the analyzing and interpreting data that the scaffolding is not enough and it's better that we try to discuss it first you try to adjust the gaps first before you start the study. Here, that's a question. Wait, Wait did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, you can always give a follow up uh, question uh, just in case. Uh, she okay. moved in a school. Um, recommend that friends, no? It's okay. Renz, if, if you want, you can always type in a follow-up uh, question. Okay. Thank you for that. And Jessica, we have another question here from a Dr. Jennifer Diamante. Hi, Jen. When can you say that your study is purely a qualitative, quantitative, or a mixed one? Oh, I would say that my, my study is more of a qualitative research because I am after the process that happened during the course of the study. I can't really say it's quantitative. Is it purely qualitative or you, or, or you think it's mixed one because there are some quantity aspects of it too? Or, oh, but you just oh. said you think it's more quality. Oh, it's more, it's more quality in nature. Because I'm after this, how the students felt during that time and what are the processes I can address as a teacher to improve my teaching. Oh, okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, here's another question from Elsa Montano. Hi, Mom Jessica. Just would like to know, saan po ina-apply ang stat sa quali aside from percentages? Thanks. Ang stat sa quali aside from percentages? I mean like, uh, yeah. When do you apply stats in quali studies? Probably that's the thing. Quali, not quanti. Oh, for qualitative, it's more of um, no, not really percentages, but more of applying the themes and checking if if there are apparent themes. And if we check on the GAIS framework provided, wait, the GAIS framework is here. Okay. Now, if we check the GAIS framework. You would notice that it's not the statistics we are talking about. It's not actually just the plug and chug method, but it's all about understanding how the process works. So, uh, for example, when they analyze their data, the fact that they are trying to understand how or what this number is making sense, or, or they're trying to make sense of how to answer or why this number is like this, we're already doing statistics. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you can always type in a follow-up question 
Elsa or Jen, if you want uh, Jessica to elaborate more on that. I'd like to share that students' experiences in senior high school stats, quantitative research, and experimental research along with their teachers' competence, handling math and stats, hold a strong influence on their collegiate course. I guess this is also true for other subjects. I interviewed my students who are now applied math and statistics students and uh, they shared that they have found the relevance of math and research while doing their senior high school research subjects. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, a comment remark. I see. Thanks for sharing that one, uh, Chanila. Uh, there's another from Maria uh, Leonora Venancho. I actually have difficulty reading because I'm, I'm using my iPad, okay? So the, the letters are just too small for me, okay? Provided the statistics is in senior high school, would you recommend that they start with qualitative uh, MUNA? Um, I suggest that they start with quantitative data first because if they don't know quanti. how to make uh -huh. quantity, yes. Uh, because if they don't know how to make sense with the numbers, uh, there is also statistics in K to 12. Um, mm -hmm. if, I suggest that they start with quantitative. It's because if they don't know how to make sense and form those numbers, they can't really describe those numbers greatly when doing qualitative data, when doing qualitative research. I so see. at least when they do quantitative, they would realize the connection and math of mathematics and of the numbers and the data they wanted to gather and understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is that clear, uh, Leonora? Okay. Yes, Bob. Okay, it's okay. So there's uh, another from Aldrin. I'm just trying to read, okay. Uh, congratulations for coming up with a very good research. This is in connection to the question of Sir Renz Gabay. As far as I can recall, only special classes like BOS sections and science high schools are expected to integrate research in grade 10. Uh, were the participants of your study from the general or mainstream classes of the depth ed grade 10 curriculum? Oh, they're from the general classes. They're uh, actually the setup of our school is that we have uh, 12 sections. One of the sections are of course the, the higher level ones. I am, they are the general classes and I made them do research because it is required by the K-12 curriculum that they need to know how to create a statistical mini research. So I chose them. And then of course, I during that time I asked my um, English comrades, um, English teachers, if they were doing research in their classes and they were saying they are doing it. So during that time, I assume that they know at least how to create the basics of research and then try to integrate mathematics in that. I see. Okay. Uh, this is coming from Renz uh, Gabay still. Uh, great tennis students normally don't have the skills in doing research as there is no research subject in the grade 10 curriculum, unless it's a special science class. I'd like to ask, how did you manage them to conduct a statistical investigation, even if they, they had no sufficient, sufficient background yet? Interesting. Ah, during this time as well, since I'm also working in a private school during that time, um, my students have their required research subjects in their previous grade levels, but it, it's more of introductory research courses. And I remember that when they were in grade nine, they are asked to create a simple research, but then it is related to their English subject. So when I checked, it is more of them knowing how to do, how to write a research, but I am after them integrating mathematics in the research they're normally writing. I see. So it's, it's a private school, that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is coming from uh, Frances. Hi, Frances Abuso. What else can you advise English teachers who have stat subject in their undergrad? 
undergrad or undergrad, okay? Uh, teaching research in senior high school besides collaborating with math or stat teachers. What if there are no capable math teachers who can assist English teachers? Hala? <laughs> um, this is a bit, uh, this is a bit of a sad question for me, but I think uh, it depends on our drive as uh, teachers if we really are passionate and we really want the kids to learn. And I think the only option for us is at least try to learn how to apply or at least try to learn how to understand the application of statistics in, in their research. Or we can also try to limit the research we want them to do instead of focusing on the higher level, higher level questions, we can make them, we can make them uh, create the simple ones. And then of course we check since English teachers, right? Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, since English teachers are more of the of checking on how the students write their research, we can also we can just focus on the simple questions, making them formulate the simple questions and see how they expound on the topic. I see. Okay. Uh, here's another from uh, Tonilo. Okay, uh, Mom, what challenges did you encounter in analyzing? or reflecting students' qualitative uh, responses and how were you able to settle them? Oh, when they were answering, when they were answering the, their qualitative responses, first I tried to, I'm not the only one working during that time. I have senior teachers working with me. So what I'm doing is that when I receive an output from a student, oh wait, uh, when I receive an output from a student, I ask my senior co-teachers as well to check on what do you think are the themes that are apparent during that time. And then, of course, if there are disagreements between us, we try to settle them. So it's more of I am checking in. And since this is an action research, I, we try as a team to check on what are the common responses that showed up between the students. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, here's another from Aldrin John Estonanto. Okay. In a typical in a typical stat classes in the Philippines, statistical concepts are usually taught using a usual teach math subject approach, where students are given formulas, examples, and exercises, word works and worksheets, then quiz, then exams. Statistics, therefore, is normally taught in isolation from research. What is your opinion regarding this practice in relation to your research findings? Thanks and congrats with your outstanding paper. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, what I can say. What my this is my again my own personal opinion is we shouldn't have taught statistics that way. It's because, um, and I understand that we really teach statistics that way It's because that is what is expected of us. But then it would have been better if instead of teaching statistics formula-wise, we try to make the students create uh, problems and try to apply the things they have learned in statistics. So in terms of my opinion we should have used a better method and i know we all know what the better methods are um and it's more of um yes it's really hard to say it but um it's really more of we need to improve our practices as teachers to make our students better and so that when they reach the higher university levels they won't struggle that much in creating research papers yeah uh, can I okay. say something about that? Yep. Because Dr. I, D. I teach statistics in the grad school and these students who are asking questions were my, stud uh, my students. And I think uh, we are able to do that in the graduate school. We, uh, I, whenever I teach statistics, I teach statistics as a tool for research. So uh, the capstone in my statistics class is usually a survey so that I can check the student's application of appropriate tests in analyzing the data. That is what statistics is all about. 
So as early as grade 10 right now in the K-12 curriculum, that should be the case, that statistics be taught mm -hmm. as a tool for research. So it can be a collaboration between the research teacher and the statistics teacher. It's also going to be good if the research teacher knows about statistics because statistics is a tool for research. That should be the emphasis. You cannot just stati you, uh, teach statistics as uh, uh, conceptually. Uh, the mm -hmm. students cannot understand that. They have to find meaning. Remember the conceptual change approach. The learner will not realize or will not achieve thorough understanding unless the learner applies the concept. So statistical concepts need to be applied in research. And that's the only way that statistics will be understood by the students. It's a tool for research. Therefore, it has to be taught in the context of research. I agree with most of you here. So I think we spread that kind of understanding among mathematics teachers so we can change the approach that is being taught right now. Because uh, most of the mathematics teachers who are teaching now were taught in the olden ways, di ba? So, mm -hmm. uh, nung araw kasi wala namang thesis ang education. Kaya mm -hmm. yung karamihan sa mga teachers natin ngayon, hindi na na-experience yung gumamit ng statistics. So, uh, that's why we need probably uh, uh, an implication of this is that uh, for those of you who are in depth ed right now and are listening, maybe you can add in the teacher's training program that that particular training for teachers of research, that uh, statistics be taught to them as a tool for research so that they can also apply it in their classes. I, uh, that's my, uh, uh, that's my uh, 10 cents worth <laughs> opinion right now. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, thank you, Dr. Bing, for sharing, okay. Uh, we have some questions here. This is from Ro Rohania Domrang. Ma'am, for example, the study was qualitative method. Mm -hmm. My statistical tools uh, use pa ba, nagagamitin? This is for Jessica. Jessica, oh. sagutin mo na yan, kaya uh -oh. mo. <laughs> If the study was qualitative method daw, may statistical tools pa daw ba na gagamitin? Eh, a qualitative naman yung method ng study? I, um, in terms of this question, you can use thematic analysis. Since it's qualitative method, you can use uh, thematic analysis to check for codes and themes that are apparent in the study. Well, but not ne necessarily statistical tools. Yes. Yes, that's true. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, ito, may, may nag-comment doon sa sharing ni Dr. Bing from Jagger Paragas. Two thumbs up. Stats should be included in teachers' LAC sessions or training program. Sabi din ni Wilmer Benito. Agree po ako, Dr. Uh, Bing, Dr. Maricar. Yan nga po ang problema. Bakit hindi po research-oriented paired with research yung statistics sa senior high? Sayang ka ako kasi preparation yan for their college. Oh, so has to be done about that. Okay, so that's how it is. Uh, this is coming from uh, Wilmer Benito. How can the statistics be used in narrative or content analysis? Is coding system or poing technique be helpful in this? Uh, yes, uh, based on when you have um, narrative analysis where you're checking the, the researchers interpret stories that are told within the context of the research. So yes, I think it is, we use thematic analysis again, and we try to use the coding system and check if there are themes that are apparent in the study. Okay. Any other questions? Very nice uh, exchange of ideas as always. Okay, so will that be all? Looks like wala naman questions from our participants. Okay, so at this point, thank you everyone for uh, participating in the Q&A. And of course, thank you, uh, Jessica, for that very insightful sharing of your study. So at this point, we'd like to, okay, request Ms. Liz to flash the certificate of appreciation for Ms. Jessica.
Okay, also Ms. Lees has already posted in our chat box the uh, link to the evaluation form. Please do accomplish the form to receive your e-certificate. Again, just a reminder, okay, when you mm -hmm. write your name, please do not use all caps, okay? Write it in ordinary way, okay? So, uh, Dr. Bing, may I request you to award the certificate of appreciation for Ms. Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. De La Salle University, I'll read the citation. De La Salle University, Brother Andrew Gonzalez, FSC, College of Education, Bag said, La Salle Institute for Development and Educational Research and Action Research, Action Learning, Aral, present this certificate of appreciation to Ms. Jessica T. Obrial uh, for Pareho tayong walang salamin. So, and <laughs> for <laughs> conducting and facilitating and serving as the speaker, resource speaker for the DLSU Bagsed Leader Aral where, uh, online lecture series entitled Use of Statistical Investigation in Assessing Students' Understanding and Performance in Statistics, held on November 9, uh, 2020. 10 a.m. to 12 noon via Zoom, signed Dr. Raymond C. Season, our Dean of Bagsed, uh, Dr. Shirley Dita, our Director of Leader, and yours truly as the Program Chair of RL 2020. Again, Jessica, our heartfelt congratulations. We know there's a big time difference. Thank you for your time yes. and yes. Uh, your willingness to share. I was talking mm -hmm. to you over the phone last night. You, uh, I cannot express more than words that I can say right now how appreciative we are here at De La Salle yeah. University. Yes, for thank, sharing, you. thank you. Yeah, for sharing with us your time. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Jessica, and congratulations. I didn't realize that Jessica is uh, not <laughs> in the Philippines at the moment, only yes. when you uh, introduced her and when she talked about the time difference. Wow, we truly appreciate uh, that one, Jessica. Thank you very much for sharing with us your knowledge, okay? And not minding the time difference. This is really uh, deeply appreciated, okay? On behalf of the LSU and Bangsen and Leader, okay? Maybe you would like yeah, to say uh, something, Jessica, as a parting words to the mm -hmm. audience, mm -hmm. to the participants. Um. I would like to thank everyone who listened patiently, though I talked for <laughs> one hour <laughs> regarding my paper. I hope I did not bore you too much. And I also, and I also appreciate those of uh, some of my students are here. Some of my friends are here who tried to support me. Thank That's you so great. much. <laughs> and, and I hope everyone that we managed to, hopefully it will give us, my research gave you an idea on how to, create an action research and if you can mm -hmm. i am endorsing it please add more uh, statistics education uh, action researches and it would be a very uh, wonderful addition to our fountain of knowledge so thank you again thank you thank you okay thank you thank you so much okay. we now invite you to the next charm session this is going to happen on November 16th, November 16th, that's on Monday, same time, 10 to 12. Uh, the title of the lecture is oh, Gamifying Online Classes in the New Normal. This sounds very interesting to be given by Miss Annaline Tolentino. So again, if uh, this is your first time to attend, we hold uh, adult online lecture every Monday. Hence, we call this one CHARM or Community Habit of Action Research on Mondays. Please do spread the word with your colleagues and with your students and with uh, your own network. We invite you to participate in our charm, okay? Every Monday, 10 to 12. Also, if you miss the previous uh, online lectures on action research, then we invite you to access our YouTube channel. Just uh, Google, I mean, if you have a uh, YouTube account, of course, um, search for DLSU, leader at DLSU leader at the LSU and all our previous online lectures on action research are uploaded in that channel. Okay, so please do subscribe to our channel to um, um, access all the previous videos on action research. So again, thank you very much, Jessica. Pwede ka nang matulog. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, yeah. 
uh, sharing with us. And thank you everyone who participated. Okay, we hope to see you again next Monday. Okay, yes. spread the word we are doing. I mean, spread all about charm. Okay, hope your friends and network can also participate in our community, in our charm, the community habit of action research on Mondays. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bing. We need to thank talk you, soon. Dr. Thank you very Shirley. much. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.